Live from New York City, it's the Gary Knoll Show. And now, your host, Gary Knoll. Hi, everyone. I'm Gary Knoll. Nice to have you with us today. We're going to talk about how breastfeeding reduces the risk of endometriosis, a study from Brigham and Women's Hospital, then how you can have a lower risk of dying from heart failure if you're taking coenzyme Q10, Yulin Chinese Medical Hospital in China, published in the British Medical Journal, Cardiovascular Disorders, and how breast cancer survivors increase the risk of dying prematurely when you're eating certain foods. I'll tell you what those foods are, what they do when you eat them. University of North Carolina, published in the Journal of the National Cancer Institute. And eating protein three times a day could make our, our older individuals over the age of 50 much stronger. McGill University Health Center, published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. And how cacao, which is natural chocolate, the flavonoids in it can protect against diabetes. A new study from Brigham University and published in the Journal of Nutritional Biochemistry. And also how millennials prefer healthy habits. And they're less likely to choose opiates to manage pain. And this is from the American Society of Anesthesiologists, but not all millennials. Which ones and why? Plus a lot more on health and healing. But today I have not one but two guests. So we're going to spend most of our program with these guests. My second guest, John Nichols, will be speaking from Madison, Wisconsin. And John is going to talk about the White House Rogue Gallery of crony capitalists and profiteers and privateers and hate mongers and racists and climate change deniers. So what is the likely outcome of a person surrounding themselves with people like this? Then the question is, I took a very careful look at the full cabinet of the last five presidents. And we have the same industrialists, the same pro-industry people, except different personalities, and hence not considered racist or hate mongers. And yet, they supported what turns out to be highly racist policies, like continuing search and seizures and, uh, and arrests and incarcerations and uh, arresting and exporting more people because they weren't here illegally. So think of this for a moment, and this will be a question I'll be asking John. Is it possible that we're no less racist in this administration because we just happen to like other people better, and when we like someone, we tend to overlook their limitations and their policies, even though the outcome to the rest of the world could be the same. If we have someone who says, I'm for peace, I want to bring peace and freedom and democratic values to a country, and therefore we will do all we can to do that without harming people. And then you go ahead and destroy an entire country, millions of people. That's what George Bush did. That's what Barack Obama did. But then the other person says, well, we're going to teach him a lesson. All options are on the table, including nuclear. And uh, they don't want to mess with us. Well, wow, that's very strident. So both are going to have the same outcome. Innocent people are going to be hurt. Should we feel any better about supporting one person because we align with their rhetoric and do not hold them accountable for the actual results? So we're going to talk about that. But before we go there, we're going to be talking with a person who is in the front lines of doing quality research on the subject of the safety and efficacy of vaccines. He is Neil Z. Miller. And Neil is a person who has spent a great deal of time examining the science. It's not political with him. It's just the science. And he's going to uh, show us what his research has found, and especially when you try to look up on Wikipedia about vaccines, and he'll tell us that the only people allowed to 
uh, put anything up on Wikipedia concerning vaccines are pro-vaccine doctors. If you challenge vaccines, suddenly you're not able to challenge, uh, change anything. Well, that's fascism. And that's, that's, uh, that's censorship. Yeah. Well, they're not alone. Google and Facebook are all targeted for censorship uh, as long as Wikipedia, if, if you have something they don't like, even if what you're saying is true, you won't get it up there. So we'll talk about that. And then also we're going to have, in between these, we're going to have a, a little interesting clip. I think you'll find it enjoyable because some people just get themselves into trouble all the time being extremely vulnerable to how they can be manipulated by the mainstream media or special interest groups. And so we're going to hear from one of those individuals who's going to talk about how the media controls our minds. J.P. Sears strikes again. So let's begin. We have a lot to share. We know that endometriosis is a very chronic and is considered by the mainstream community incurable gynecological disorder that affects about 10 percent of women in the United States. Now, its symptoms can be debilitating, chronic pelvic pain, uh, painful periods, pain during intercourse. But a new study from scientists at Brigham and Women's Hospital finds that women who breastfed for longer periods of time had significantly low risk of being diagnosed with endometriosis. And that's an important quote from the study, British Medical Journal. We found that women who breastfed for a greater duration were less likely to be diagnosed with endometriosis. Given the chronic nature of endometriosis and the very few modifiable risk factors are currently known, breastfeeding may be an important modifying behavior to reduce the risk among women after pregnancy. And this was a part of the nurse's health study, which has got a lot of nurses over decades, so it's a good study. I also found that one of the ways I'm able to help women dissolve um, fibrocystic breasts, also to help prevent or ameliorate uh, the cancers of the reproductive system, including uterine cancers, ovarian cancers, ovarian cysts, is first and foremost get on to a highly alkalizing diet and get rid of anything that is highly acidic, like caffeine causes cysts to grow and can cause endometriosis to be exacerbated. I know from working with tens of thousands of women that when I'm able to get them to take alkalizing juices like putting lemon juice, uh, apple cider vinegar, ginger, all together with chlorophyll, it you can see within a period of six months conditions improving tremendously, including with endometriosis. Also, a good study from the British Medical uh, Journal, it looked at a meta, meaning many, um, analysis of randomized controlled trials. And they compared coenzyme Q10 and a placebo versus are you less, more, or at the same risk of dying because of a heart condition? And what they found in this study is, quote, our research is the newest meta-analysis that analyzes the efficacy of coenzyme Q10 in heart failure patients. And they found that supplementation orally of coenzyme Q10, uh, when you increase the plasma levels and the platelets and the white blood cells are increased, you reduce your risk of dying of heart failure. How about that? So that's important. I would suggest 100 milligrams three times a day. And if you have had a heart attack, then with your physician or your professional care provider, uh, you'll be able to increase that amount along with other protective foods and juices and supplements. Now, breast cancer is the most common cancer among women in the United States. We'll have about 230,000 women diagnosed this year with breast cancer. It's also a major killer. But according to a new study, if you eat grilled or smoked meats, 
you really increase your risk of dying compared to those who do not have those. So the question is how cooking meats at high temperatures can generate toxins that are dangerous. And they took a look at breast cancer over an almost an 18-year period, survivors, and what they found was the one thing that stood out, if you had meat, grilled meat, barbecued meat, or smoked meats, and after the diagnosis of breast cancer, quote, it carried an increased risk of death by 31 percent. Wow. And the University of Minnesota study, women who ate overcooked hamburgers increased their breast cancer risk by 50 percent compared to those who ate them rare. And the Iowa Women's Health Study found that women who regularly ate well-done steak and hamburgers and bacon had a shocking 462 percent increase in the risk of developing breast cancer. Now, of course, the only way people eat bacon in the United States is well done. You have high saturated fats, you have a diseased meat, it's high in bacteria, you have heterocyclic amines, you have nitrates, so there's nothing good about bacon at all. So, and yet now with almost every ad you see, you see them giving you more meat, more bacon with the meat, even now they're adding, I just saw an ad where they add french fries or onion rings with cheese onto bacon over eggs on hamburger. I mean, that's a heart attack waiting to happen. So the problem is twofold. One, we do not now, nor have we had, a public health policy where as a government, the interest of the public's health comes first and therefore promoting food awareness. And instead, what we have is government paid for and manipulated by special interest groups, and then those agencies that involve themselves in health, like the USDA and the FDA and the CDC and the National Cancer Institute and the National Institutes of Mental Health, all being influenced by scientists for hire who then sit on their advisory boards and then say, no, you could, you could have meat, you could have bacon, you could have, and, with, and then who's going to come forward and say these all cause disease? And therefore, it, we only hear that, gee whiz, what a breakfast. You eat this breakfast for $3, you're not going to be hungry. And so it's relatively inexpensive, and it's junk food, but it's also killing food. It only produces disease. It does nothing to contribute to health, nothing at all. So to prevent breast cancer, we have to inform women everywhere that when you have that pizza with the pepperoni on it, or the pastrami, or you have a hamburger, well done, or a steak, well done, or your barbecue grilled, you're increasing your risk of breast cancer by up to 50 percent. Also, for people over the age of 50, a couple things you begin to notice. First, you begin to notice a loss of muscle mass in both men and women. You also begin to see the crepey skin. The crepey skin is that skin that kind of folds around your knees and under your arms and uh, around your neck. And that's generally due to a loss of collagen synthesis. And so everything becomes jowy and just hangs. Gravity pulls it down. You also see a lack of energy. Now, this is generally due to a lack of human growth hormone. Now, if we were exercising six days a week for an hour, you produce human growth hormone. If you're going on a good plant-based diet, you also produce the nutrients. And if you're supplementing, like with quercetin, you're creating more collagen. Hence, you'll have better muscle mass, better definition of the muscles, the cuts, and the abs, the pecs, the delts, the tra trapezoids. And hence, you'll look better, be stronger. So age in and of itself is not a cause of muscle decline, energy decline, or getting out of shape. Getting out of shape causes those, not age itself. So we just need a whole national, let's get up and do some good exercise and start being more conscious. Now, also, a lot of people miss breakfast. They think having some 
oh, let's say coffee and a donut or coffee and a bagel or cream cheese and coffee and toast, that's not a breakfast. All that is is going to create GERD and gastrointestinal problems. But your breakfast means breaking a fast, and therefore your body needs nourishment. And that's why I advocate a smoothie to which you can add about 20 grams of high-quality vegetable protein, split pea, brown rice, non-GMO soy, and uh, uh, hemp protein. These are all high-quality and rich in fibers. And that gives you about one-half your protein requirements for the day. But And then put berries in there, a handful of berries, a pint of berries, a handful of walnuts or, or almonds or macadamians, a teaspoon of coconut oil, a teaspoon of flaxseed oil, and you're good to go. You've given your body everything it needs in the way of vitamins, minerals, protein, fats, carbohydrates that are all complex and essential and fibers. But we don't eat that way. We tend to have no or little breakfast, small lunch, and then be ravenous and have an over large dinner. Big mistake, because if you don't space your protein, the body cannot use it. There's no mechanism in the body to store protein. So any amount of beyond what your body actually requires, it goes through a process we call deaminization, where you break down the amino acids, you get two byproducts, ammonium and urea, which are toxic to the brain and the kidneys, which is one of the reasons we have so much kidney disease tape, because we're eating way too much protein. We're protein phobic. And so it's best now, according to this study, which was published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition and done at McGill University up in Montreal, that have your protein three times a day. Okay, good. Now, have that smoothie. That gets you your protein. Then sometime in the early afternoon, you can have hummus, which is good protein from chickpeas, stuffed into an avocado, which is great. It's got amino acids also, plus essential fatty acids. That's what I call grazing lunch, meaning it's small. You won't be weighted down. You won't feel full. You should never, ever eat till you feel full. Always stop eating when you still have more energy. And that way you can keep going. So, And then in the early evening, you can have like a, a lentil stew. Or you can have a combination of, uh, let's say, a grain and a starchy vegetable, seaweed. So space it out live a longer life. That's the latest on health and healing. We're going to take a brief break and come right back. And we're coming right back in to J.P. Sears talking about how much control the media has over our brains. Please stay with us. Would you like to escape the horrible reality of thinking your own thoughts? Me too. Learning to have your mind controlled is your key to escaping the hell of thinking for yourself. Good evening. Life is a dangerous tragedy. Whenever you accidentally start feeling peaceful or start thinking about what's really important to you, that's your cue to turn on the news. We'll make you scared instead. Then you'll instinctively want someone to protect you, which will make you completely submissive and controllable to those who you think will protect you. I live in a constant state of fear because scary things would happen if I wasn't scared all the time. Thinking for yourself is like going to the grocery store and bagging your own groceries. It's just a lower class way of living. It's significantly more luxurious to have someone else bag your groceries for you. We'll tell you what other people are concerned about, and because you don't want to feel left out, you'll start to feel concerned about those things too. Then you'll have an artificial sense of belonging. You'll sleep better at night when you're convinced to believe the thoughts in your head are your own. Because they're in your mind, it'll be easy for you to believe they came from your mind. Terrorism. Based on what I see in the news, I assume that right now there's a band of terrorists hiding in the bushes in front of my house waiting to get me. You're free to do anything we want you to do. You need to be under the spell of fear to make you hypnotically suggestible. Poverty, disease, terrorism, war, nuclear war, cyber warfare, germ warfare, biochemical warfare, and death are all wonderful things to be afraid of. Then it's much easier for you to be controlled because you'll be convinced to do whatever they want you to do because you'll think doing so will help you avoid one of the things you're afraid of. 
I want to be heavily vaccinated so I can be protected from the diseases that I've been told to be extremely afraid of. We'll help you obsessively monitor large-scale politics because it'll help you ignore your own life. Having your mind controlled means you won't have to waste effort and energy thinking. You'll be controlled really well the more you think your happiness depends on what's happening on a global level instead of what you actually do in your life on a daily basis. I've learned that pursuing money is what my life's all about. Each time we say the term, the economy, it's code for money is what will make you happy. This belief helps you fit perfectly into the system. If I didn't constantly monitor the news cycle, then I'd be uninformed. Uninformed of what's in the news cycle. If you feel worse after watching it, then you're doing better. The scary thing is that if you went a day without watching the news, you start to notice that there are a lot more things to appreciate than there are to be afraid of. That's why it's important to watch the news every day, preferably three times a day. Imagine the disaster that would happen if you got in touch with your passions. They might lead you to want to do things that are outside of your thrilling coffin of conformity. Then you'd probably end up getting shot at point-blank range by a nuclear missile and eaten by wolves. It's a scary world out there. Okay. Now let's go over to someone who can tell us about how scary some of our health policies are, and that's Neil Z. Miller. Uh, Neil is a researcher specializing in science research. Uh, he has spent thousands of hours working on the subject of the safety and efficacy of vaccines, and he's on our conference call right now. Nice to have you with us today, Neil. Thanks, Gary. I'm, I appreciate uh, having the opportunity to share some information with everyone. Neil, I'm getting a little feedback. Are you on a, a Skype conference? I'm on a landline, but it is a bad connection. That, that's oh. sure. Hang up. We're going to call you right back, all right? Okay. We'll get right back to Neil. And I'm going to be asking Neil some very just simple questions uh, that all of us need to hear his answer. Why? Because Neil's not coming at this as someone who is pro or anti-vaccine. He simply did the research, tremendous amount of research. We're talking about tens of thousands of hours of research. And now he's come up with what he found. And therefore, he's giving us the benefit of sharing this. So we're going to go back to him now. Hopefully, we have a better connection and uh, we'll get his input. Neil, are you back with us? Yes? No? All right, he'll be back in a second here. And a little later on, just after Neil, we're going to take a break and then come back with our other guest on a topic that's absolutely essential to our well-being, knowing who's in the White House and why the power they maintain over us is not a good idea. While we're looking to get Neil back on the line, let me give you the latest on our environmental update. And that is that there are problems with fracking that we have not anticipated as a country and the media has not fully explored. And this is from uh, the Natural Society. One is methane spewing geysers. According to Elisa Garber, if we take a careful look at the scientific literature, fracking, which of course we know is the act of pumping water and chemicals underground in order to facilitate the flow of oil or gas, it's it's not terribly hard for a giant corporation like Shell or Chesapeake Energy Corporation to start fracking wherever the company pleases. Or well, regulators don't even require drilling companies to search the area for abandoned wells. And this is why unplugged, forgotten wells like um, Butters Well in Pennsylvania in Tioga County, drilled in 1932, literally burst with gas when drilling displaces underground pockets of methane as it turns out, and Shell knew about Butter's well, it just did not plug it. So abandoned wells, of which there are thousands, uh, aren't the only ways dis disrupted gas escapes. Cracks in the ground can also emit this highly flammable gas, methane. Also, did you ever think that your land is not your land? One Chesapeake employee was recorded saying, quote, if properties don't want to uh, sign, uh, if we have 90% secured uh, the well that we need, we have the power to put these people in the lease without their permission. We can do whatever we want, end quote. Well, 
Chesapeake and other drilling corporations are eager to spend billions to snag drilling rights. And they do the math, and it's no wonder states follow suit. Here's what Reuters reports, quote, In its petition, Chesapeake told regulators its proposed drilling unit could produce 4.5 million barrels of oil and 3.5 billion cubic feet of natural gas if the plots of 49 landowners who didn't lease their property to Chesapeake were included. If not, Chesapeake said the unit would be 75 percent less productive and would, would miss out on an additional $71 million in revenue. And that math carried a day. So whoever bring, brings the big checkbook wins the day. Also, contaminated wine. Fracking-derived groundwater pollution doesn't just mean contaminated drinking water, although that's a concern uh, that we don't want dirty water. Dirty water means dirty crops, even dirty wine. Uh, Simon Selenes, a member of the Monterey County's Board of Supervisors, says in response to Finoco's prospective drilling in the vineyard-rich county, quote, anything that can taint our water and food supply could be devastating to our economy. Well, it doesn't help that Monterey already competes with Napa and Sonoma wine, and proximity to fracking activity would do nothing for the region's marketability. One winery in Brooklyn, New York, even hosted an anti-fracking benefit. Quote, many of our wine bars seasonal menu items include ingredients grown on upstate farms, the winery's website. So if you, if you have fracking water, which is terribly contaminated and polluted and dangerous, and if that water is used and, and gets underground into aquifers, then all the irrigated crops, I don't care if it's corn or organic crops, are going to be contaminated. So that's a big problem. And also it poisons animals. Not even the all-American burger, grass-fed or not, is, is immune from the dangers of fracking. Fracking fluid consumption killed 16 cows in Louisiana, and hundreds of others raised near fracking sites are being reported affected. So one more reason to go vegan, but also one more reason to say no to fracking and start regulating them and closing them down. We have Neil Miller back on the line. Neil, let us go right to the issue. Right now, okay. if you tried to put any article up that was anti-fracking on Wikipedia, good luck with that, because it seems like Wikipedia has only pro-vaccine advocates. Also, if you have a report that shows danger in the scientific from the scientific literature's reporting on the safety or lack of efficacy in vaccines, good luck having any mainstream media cover that objectively or fairly. What has been your response when you've taken good quality science, good scholarship, no politics involved, no vested interest involved, and tried to share that information in any of the mainstream or alternative medias? Well, there's a concerted effort right now by the, uh, by the pharmaceutical industry, the CDC, the World Health Organization, and just the medical industry in general to shut down any kind of uh, alternative information about vaccines. It's, uh, they just want the uh, pro-vaccine uh, narrative to be presented. And so part of, this, uh, part of this objective is involved in getting Google to change their algorithms so that people that are searching for information about, for example, adverse reactions. Uh, I have a website at thinktwice.com, and we used to get hundreds and thousands of hits um, you know, every day. And uh, people would type in, my son had an adverse reaction, and they would pull up my, uh, you know, and it would come up in the Google search. Today, you can't, you know, we, we get hardly any hits on our, on our website, and, every, every, and, and I've talked to other people, and the same thing is, is happening. If you type in adverse reaction to vaccine, all you're going to get now are CDC-sponsored websites and pharmaceutical industry websites that are telling you that there's not anything to worry about and that adverse reactions are rare. With Wikipedia, the same thing is happening. They've targeted Wikipedia and they have a whole cadre of uh, professional um, writers behind the scenes so that when you go up to Wikipedia and you try to put anything in about uh, 
Uh, well, anything negative about GMOs or anything negative, like you say, about fracking or anything negative about vaccines, they will rewrite that information to, again, put forth a pro, pro for example, in my, in my case, in the information that I um, research with vaccines, they'll, they'll rewrite it so that it only shows a pro-vaccine stance, and they'll actually take out any information that shows negativity uh, associated with with vaccines. The same is going on with Facebook, and they want to target YouTube. Actually, YouTube is, has been the least, uh, the most resistant to these changes, I believe. But they're they're pushing a lot of pressure on YouTube as well. So censorship is alive and well today. Absolutely. Okay. I, I, we're going to have a short answer for each of these, but I have seen the peer review literature. I have copies of them, thousands of articles for our own more than 15,000 hours of research we've done on the topic. But so please give us the short answer on these. <clears throat> Is there any scientific literature that you can find done by independent, journal, uh, independent scientists that prove the safety of all the ingredients in any single vaccine or the safety of a combination of all the vaccines that are given at one time to an adult or child? No, I've, uh, you know, my, my latest book, Miller's Review of Critical Vaccine Studies, documents 400 studies that are peer reviewed in the medical literature showing problems with the vaccines. And uh, these problems are absolutely magnified when you combine these vaccines. They're giving eight vaccines to children at two months, four months, and six months of age, and there is no scientific evidence that this is a safe practice. This is actually a very dangerous practice, and I, I actually conducted a study with Dr. Gary Goldman, and in our study, we found that when you, multi when you give multiple vaccines simultaneously, it increases the death rates, the hospitalization and death rates. So that's, a, that's my short answer for that. All right. And my second question is, with all the scientific studies that are available, independent studies that are not in any way biased, how many of those studies can prove efficacy, sustainable efficacy, in any given individual receiving that vaccine or combination of vaccines? Well, you know, efficacy, again, the short answers aren't always possible. And, and here's, here's one of the reasons why. Efficacy is a funny word. A lot of people think that that's simple to define, but there's actually, you know, five or six different ways that effectiveness and efficacy are measured. For example, some ways that efficacy is actually measured is that scientists will do a study and they'll say, that we believe that a certain, um, if we give a vaccine that uh, people, you know, to, 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 to provide uh, efficacy, the, we can measure the, the antibody production in the blood so that we can measure before and after so that if we have uh, so many teeters before the vaccine is given and then we give the vaccine and, and the, 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 t the titers for, you know, the antibodies levels have been, been raised and if we do that to 100 people and 95% of the population have their antibody t titers raised to a certain level, then, then they, they will claim that the vaccine is 95% effective. Um, but of course, in, in all practicality, when you go out into the field and you give the vaccine, uh, there's a lot of other factors involved. For example, many of these people uh, with, well, for example, the, the, the vaccines themselves um, efficacy will wane after anywhere from a few months to a few years. And in fact, this is one of the reasons that with many vaccines that they, they put in aluminum into, into vaccines, which is very toxic. Aluminum is a neurotoxin and it also causes, uh, in, in, you know, immune, immunological damage. Uh, but they put the, 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 the aluminum in to raise the efficacy of these vaccines, but it's really just um, it's really just what I call a uh, a neat technical trick. It's just tricking the body into producing antibodies, and of course, antibody production is only one aspect of uh, of, of immunity. So, so it's actually a little bit more complex. Uh, but that's just uh, that's my my sort of semi brief answer to that, I guess. Good. Neil, we look forward to a continuing conversation on this, but I'm glad you came on and at least shared some of this, that there's a great deal of bias within the media. And uh, I'm a person who spent more than 15,000 hours of researching the scientific literature. I know you have. 
I know at least six individuals who have, and yet they'll be debating people who have researched vaccines not at all. They simply take the talking points from the CDC, and, and that's what they bring forth. And the media is not looking into the background of the people who are on the payrolls to see would that in any way uh, limit or compromise their objectivity. And so the public well, the media, needs an open Robert, and honest debate. According to Robert Kennedy Jr., the reason that the media refuses to allow an open, honest debate, and the reason they're complicit in all of this medical tyranny, because that's what we're really discussing. We're, talk, we're talking about an oppressive medical um, allopathic, uh, you know, pr process here, um, where they're taking away our human rights. Um, but the reason that Robert Kennedy has discovered is that major media receives 70 percent of their income from the pharmaceutical industry, so they don't want to do anything that will jeopardize uh, those funds. Well, Robert Kennedy was on the program recently and said pretty much what you're saying. Thank you very much, Neil, for being on and sharing it. Neil Z. Miller, my guest. Now, we're going, going to take a very short break and come right back with our uh, next guest who's waiting, standing by. John Nichols, so please stay with us. I'd like to welcome all of you from all over the world who are listening right now. We're going to Madison, Wisconsin. We're standing by as John Nichols. John is a pioneering, prolific, progressive journalist who serves as the national affairs correspondent writing on domestic politics for The Nation magazine and as associate editor of the Capital Times in Madison, Wisconsin. He is also contributing author for The Progressive and in these times, and his articles have appeared in the New York Times, Chicago Tribune, and dozens of other publications. And along with the brilliant scholar of American media, Robert McChesney, John is the co-founder of Free Press, and he's published many books, including the best-selling biography on Dick Cheney and It's the Media Stupid with Professor McChesney. And his most recent book is Horseman of the uh, Trump uh, Trumpocalypse, a field guide to the most dangerous people in America, which goes into great depth and detail into the rogues gallery of hate mongering and racists and crony capitalists and immigrant bashers and climate change deniers who are now running America. And you can read John's articles at thenation.com. Nice to have you with us today, John. It's great to be with you, Gary. I hope our connection's a good one. It's fine. Thank you. John, Excellent. I'd like if you would please to begin with the big picture. You've been investigating and going deep into the histories of all the Trump cabinet members and counselors and advisors and supporters for a long time. And you've said that these people virtually have the influence and power and wealth to define the future of the world. And this should worry us greatly. Will you explain on this further and how now uh, this is impacting this administration. And since sure. it seems to be a continual state of chaos with people coming and going or shape-shifting roles within or outside the administration, do you regard or perhaps what do you feel about the most dangerous of our domestic policies? And finally, on that one topic, explain why you regard this administration as America's first imperial presidency. The form is yours. Well, you are very generous in, in laying out so many avenues to go down. I hope you will uh, interrupt me at a couple points and, and uh, remind me of things that I forget to address. But uh, I really appreciate the forum, and I really appreciate uh, the interest that, that you and so many other people have taken in this book. It's, it's, uh, been, it's done very well, and I think one of the reasons for that is that people are starting to wake up to a reality, and that is that Donald Trump is not capable of governing. He knows very little about governing. He has no background in it. And uh, there isn't the sort of transference from business to governing that an awfully lot of our Republican friends seem to think. And so if you want to understand the Trump administration beyond the bad theater of an of a obnoxious tweet or an obnoxious press conference, if you want to get to the heart of the matter of what's happening, in our name, but often without our informed consent, you have to look at the people he has empowered. And it, it troubles me that much of our media has not done that, because it's very, very clear that the people Donald Trump has put into positions of power 
fall into four groups, simple groups. The first of them are bleary-eyed ideologues, just impassioned folks who uh, cannot be changed by the facts. They literally are driven to force their ideology onto the country, even though it's a fringe ideology. A classic example of this is somebody like Chris Kobach, who the president has put in charge of a, a host of election and voting rights issues. Kobach has a, a long history, I've been writing about him for more than a decade, of uh, attacking voting rights, undermining access to the polls, of, of really using the law to make it more difficult for tremendous numbers of Americans to vote. He's a terrible person to have there, just as Betsy DeVos is a terrible person to have at the Department of Education. You can run down the list. The next group are the militarists, um, the generals. And one of the things I argue very strongly is that while these people are often portrayed as the adults in the room, uh, what we should want in a, a presidency and an administration is not just adults in the room, but adults who have good ideas. And too many of these generals who have been put in positions of power are really old school militarists. They want to massively increase the Pentagon budget. They are not particularly serious about uh, diplomacy are not as serious as they should be. That's not true of all of them, but some, and it's a concerning thing because the diminishing of the State Department by Rex Tillerson means that the Pentagon's authority and power is much greater than it's ever been. Uh, I, I would argue that at any time in, in uh, certainly recent decades. The third group that I talk about uh, are hacks, just Republican hangers on. I think these are some of the darkest players in the administration because they know Donald Trump shouldn't be president. They know he is an incompetent president at best and a nefarious and destructive president at, at worst, and yet they continue to enable it. This includes his appointees, but it also includes um, Paul Ryan, the Speaker of the House, Mitch McConnell, the leader of the Senate. The final group that I look at is, uh, the, it's the largest group. It's the people I refer to as the privateers, the people who are there to get a hold of a piece of the U.S. government and take as much out of it as they can for the interest group that they are a part of, for the class that they are a part of, to really restructure the workings of government in order to redistribute wealth upwards and to enrich themselves, in some cases, or people like them. And this is a very, very large category, and you know, we can go as deep as you want on it. But the, the core thing to understand is that because we have made cabinet agencies and these appointed positions, these regulatory agencies, so very powerful, literally they can, they can call the shots in vast areas. And because Congress stands down so often, it does so little oversight, uh, we have exactly what Dwight Eisenhower feared when he talked about a military industrial complex. And we also have what Arthur Schlesinger Jr. warned about when he spoke of an imperial presidency. An imperial presidency isn't about one man, but it is about making the administration, making all the agencies that extend from that one man into something uh, much like the royal courts of old. An incredibly powerful, uh, very self-supportive, self-focused entity that doesn't respond to democracy, but does respond to the passionate desire on the part of, of many of these people to reorder the United States in a way that benefits them, that may profit them, but does tremendous harm to the rest of us. So this is a deep dive into, into this world. And I think it's, I would argue that whether I wrote it or somebody else did, it's incredibly important because if we just focus on Donald Trump, if we don't pay attention to the people he has empowered, we run the profound risk of imagining that we have controlled Donald Trump or that we have resisted or restricted him and then waking up and realizing that his minions, the people he has appointed, have gone off and done incredibly destructive things without most of us being informed. I appreciate the overview. Thank you. Now let's do a few of the individuals in greater depth because there's been on the left a tendency to portray Rex Tillerson at the State Department as a more sane voice of reason and somewhat removed from the military hawks around Trump, such as General Kelly, Mattis, and McMaster, McMaster. But you've observed that Tillerson is right in line with the generals because his ultimate mission is to dismantle the State Department, which has always been our voice, the people's voice, for diplomacy and negotiation 
with other nations, at least to the degree that you don't have a pure political ideologue as Secretary of State. So I regard this as absolutely frightening if it means that foreign affairs becomes primarily military decisions. So will you dive into this more with the evidence showing th that this Tillerson and Trump's intention to limit the State Department, and how will this shift not only our international relations, but also our internal affairs towards the worst? That's a tremendous question. I'm, I'm glad you focused on it. Now, a few folks that we've talked to about in this uh, tour and in talking about the book have, have noticed it. I wish more would because it was very intentional on my part to include Rex Tillerson in the list of the generals. Uh, he's not a general, never has been. Uh, he's CEO of a multinational corporation that was frankly larger than a lot of countries. Uh, but the decision to place Rex Tillerson in charge of the U.S. State Department, rather than uh, a conservative like Mitt Romney or someone who actually wanted to do something with it, uh, was a really one of the critical moments in the formation of the Trump presidency, and the one that actually perhaps could lead to what we fear, this notion of a Trumpocalypse, something where things really go awry. And, and here's what, what uh, I write about. When Tillerson came before the U.S. Senate, he was asked um, what his opinions were on a variety of issues and how they related to President Trump's positions. Again and again, he said, well, I haven't talked to the president about that. Uh, we didn't we didn't get into that. Um, and it was sort of a shocking conversation at the time. Here's a man being put into one of the the legacy positions of of our federal government. Uh, this Department of State has existed since George Washington's presidency. Uh, it was opened up by Thomas Jefferson. And people who have held it throughout history have always been viewed as uh, historically second only to the president in their authority and in their importance. Um, with Tillerson, a guy who acknowledged that he hadn't talked to Donald Trump about what they were going to do or why they were going to do, clearly was going there merely as a manager, not as a leader, not as somebody with a vision, not even as somebody with a determination to advance Donald Trump's vision. And we've seen some evidence of that. He even rather casually says he doesn't agree with Trump on this or that. But the important thing to understand is, since he's gotten to the State Department, he has been a yes man for proposals to cut back on what the State Department does, for proposals to shut down whole elements of what the State Department does, and most importantly, uh, just for casually leaving positions open. I've talked to many State Department folks in, in the preparation of this book and since. In fact, I was just at an event where a number of State Department people came to hear me talk. And it, invariably, what they will tell you is that they have never seen the State Department so weak, so undermined, with so many positions unfilled, with so little happening. And what I would suggest to you is that Rex Tillerson is managing the State Department into a corner, into a secondary position. What that means is that in this long-term sort of push and pull, a creative tension, if you will, between the State Department and the Pentagon, the Pentagon now becomes overwhelmingly dominant. And then if you look at the reality that Mick Mulvaney, the head of the Office of Management and Budget, and the key person on budgeting for President Trump, has actively encouraged moving tens of billions of dollars from domestic programs over to the Pentagon, but no more to the, the State Department, no, no great support of the State Department, but this massive infusion of money to the Pentagon, what you realize is that we are at the Eisenhower moment. Eisenhower gave two great speeches in his presidency. One of them was warning about the military industrial complex and saying that it could destroy democracy at home if it's allowed to get out of control. The other speech he gave a number of years earlier is called the Cross of Iron speech. In that speech, he said, look, at the end of the day, because taxpayers will only pay so much and because uh, budgets operate the way they are, you have to make choices. And those choices must balance defense of the country and safety with maintenance of the basic programs of the country to make sure that, that it is a humane and decent and functional country. That, under this administration, is not happening. This administration, and really importantly, these key players in this administration are managing us into a circumstance where the Pentagon is all powerful, where the generals have immense say, and where 
Our domestic programs are starving, literally subjected to austerity, and where our potential to avert wars with diplomacy and aid has been undermined, while the potential to go into wars, uh, because we've done so much preparation, because we have so much weaponry, is accelerated. It's the most dangerous thing happening in this administration. John, Hurricane Harvey and the devastation of Houston and surrounding region, including Louisiana, came on the heels of Trump's wiping out flood control policies. And talk about a clarion moment. The chemical plant that exploded was found to be in serious violation of safety regulations. And here Scott Pruitt and others like Rick Perry, a real, a real goofball, would do away with the EPA altogether, which is responsible for investigating and monitoring safety measures in chemical factories. And these are all climate change deniers running the show. So how can you possibly hope there won't be even worse human catastrophes when weather events such as Harvey appear in the future, which is inevitable? And because given the way Washington works, it's easier to dismantle something than it is to build or rebuild something after it is removed. So look at how many bills and policies signed by Obama have already been whisked away with Trump simply signing his name. Your thoughts, please. Well, I think you're going to another heart of the matter issue. And this is, a, this is an incredibly big deal. Doing this book was a, uh, a very positive experience for me, even though I'm, I'm a very critical person as regards the Trump administration, because it, it forced me to come to understand, uh, as somebody who's covered politics for a long time, but to really get deep into these agencies and to get deep into the power they have um, and how they, they exercise that power. And one of the things that, that is, is very clear is that the person who heads the Environmental Protection Agency has tremendous leeway, tremendous flexibility to make it a useful agency or a useless agency. Putting Scott Pruitt, a climate denier, and really an activist on behalf of the fossil fuel companies and corporate America in general, in charge of the EPA meant that there was an immediate dialing down of its commitment. It, it's been undermined in, in terrible ways. He has shut down Obama initiatives. You're right. He was a cheerleader for getting out of the Paris Accords or Paris Agreement. Um, again and again, he's been on the wrong side of these issues. This week, he's been criticizing scientists and the media for mentioning climate change in regard to what's happened in Texas. And, and the scientists who stepped up have been very responsible. They haven't said that, that the hurricanes themselves are caused by climate change. What they're saying is something that the scientific community agrees on, that when you have warming water, when you have global warming in general, the storm surges become dramatically greater, the flooding goes further, it reaches to places it hadn't reached before, the devastation is greater. And that's what the scientists are just trying to communicate. They're trying to make this a teaching moment, which is very, very useful. And yet our EPA is actually trying to shut them up. And so that's one side of it. And let me just offer you one other side of it. When we talk about these policies, and you really talk about building things and making things that are functional, it's not the EPA as much as the Department of Transportation that becomes important. Department of Transportation oversees immense amounts of our infrastructure spending. If there is a trillion dollar infrastructure bill, a lot of it will go through there. Think of roads and bridges, but also even physical facilities, which Department of Transportation often has a huge role in uh, providing the support for and actually you know, implementing the rules with regard to. Just two weeks ago, President Trump and Secretary of Transportation Elaine Chao announced that the president was overturning an Obama-era rule, which was referred to as the Federal Flood Risk Management Standard. That standard, put in a couple of years ago, was based on an understanding of the threat of climate change and of the things that will happen in the future. And what they said was just a simple thing, actually a very fiscally conservative thing. They said that under that standard, that if U.S. money goes into building a road or building a bridge, or building a facility to store waste, or anything else, that that project must be climate resilient, i.e., it has to be built in a way that understands, that respects, that addresses the threat posed 
by flooding, by storm surges, by these much more horrific storms, which we've seen so many of and, and which we are likely to see in the future. It was a very logical, necessary rule. And now that's off the books. They knocked that off the books. They got rid of that standard. And what that means is that when Houston finally begins to dry, and when these horrible environmental crises in and around Houston as this water has gone into refinery areas and chemical plants and manufacturing areas and, and caused all sorts of dangers, when that is, is finally addressed, when and if it is, the new facilities that will be built, often with U.S. taxpayer dollars, will not necessarily be built in a way that can withstand the next storm surge and the next flood. And this is what I mean about the Trumpocalypse, when I, why we developed that term. People need to understand that when you put politicos, when you put ideologues, when you put privateers in charge of these agencies, when they don't put the public interest first, but when they put profits and lobbyists and their own ideologies first, you end up in a situation where the disasters of today are repeated again and again and again because these people literally refuse to listen to science or even to engage logically with you know, the, the future we know is coming. John, we appreciate your, your coming on the air here. And we also appreciate the fact you took the time and energy to write this book. And uh, people should know about it. And people can also read all of John's articles by going, by going to thenation.com. John Nichols, thanks for being on with us today. It's been a total honor, Gary. Thank you so much for having me on. All the best. We're at the end of our program.